Good evening and welcome to Vespers at Charter House. I'm so happy to be with you for a time of prayer and worship this evening. You're also invited to come to Vespers in person in the chapel, first floor, Sundays at 4 p.m. I now invite you to gather with me for worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Breath of God, breath of life, breath of deepest yearning, come Holy Spirit. Comforter, disturber, interpreter, enthuser, come Holy Spirit. Heavenly friend, lamplighter, revealer of truth, midwife of change, come Holy Spirit. The Lord is here, God's Spirit is with us. Let us pray. Holy God, our righteous judge, daily your mercy surprises us with everlasting forgiveness. Strengthen our hope in you and grant that all the peoples of the earth may find their glory in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, amen. The Psalm appointed for today is Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O blessed architect of the universe. My soul longs, yes, aches for the abode of the beloved. All that is within me sings for joy to the living heart of love. Even as the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nesting place, where its young are raised within your majestic creation, you invite us to dwell within your heart. Blessed are they whose hearts are filled with love, who sing praises to you with grateful, grateful hearts. Blessed are they who put their strength in you, who choose to share the joys and sorrows of this world. They do not give way to fear or doubt. They are quickened by divine light and power. They dwell within the peace of the Most High. They go from strength to strength and live with integrity. Let us pray. O oh God, our sun and shield, you heard the prayer of Christ your anointed and raised him to the lasting joy of your presence. Guide us in our pilgrimage through life, that loving you and offering praise in your house, we may find a home in your eternal dwelling place and joyfully look upon your glorious splendor, which we behold in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, without even looking up to heaven, was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. Here ends the gospel reading. Remember how the Apostle Paul once called the gospel a stumbling block to some? Paul Tillich, the theologian commenting on this, once said that the danger is stumbling 
over the wrong thing. That can happen to us reading today's gospel. So let's take a closer look at this text in Luke 18. On the surface, the parable seems so simple. We are used to judging the Pharisees as a, just a bunch of people who opposed Jesus. Self-righteous hypocrites. It's easy. On the face of the parable, the message is, be humble. So simple, even boring. Why would Jesus tell such a boring, simple parable? The problem is that if we hear it that way, we just end up saying to ourselves, Lord, we thank you that we are not like other people. Hypocrites, so pious, self-righteous, goody-goody, like that Pharisee was. We come to church each week. We listen attentively to the scripture. And we have learned that we should always be humble. That way we end up just like the Pharisee, patting ourselves on the back. But what then? What is the parable really about? And what is our Lord's purpose here in telling it? We know that our Lord Jesus is a brilliant teacher, a genius with a heart of love. So what is he trying to teach us here? What helps is to remember that, in fact, everything the Pharisee says is true. He has set himself apart from others by his faithfulness to the law. He is, according to Luke's and Jesus' standards, righteous. And consider this, have we also said, Lord, I thank you that I am not like those other people? How about saying to ourselves, there but for the grace of God go I? Oh, yes, we have. We, all the time, we think it. Also, the Pharisee isn't lying. No, instead, the Pharisee has missed out on the true nature of his blessing. He has trusted in himself. He may say thanks to the Lord, but it is really all about himself. All his righteousness is found in his own actions in himself alone. What about the tax collector? He, in stark contrast, knows he's got nothing. He has no ground to stand upon, no basis for righteousness. Not only has he done nothing right, even more, he has done a lot of things to offend the law of Israel and his own people. He doesn't even come close to the temple, into it. He doesn't even raise up his head. He throws himself on the mercy of God. I have known people who were there. I have been there. Have you ever tried to talk with someone who was so ashamed that they couldn't even raise up their head? I have. Have you ever had someone you love not even be able to look you in the eye? This tax collector couldn't raise up his face. He couldn't look God in the eye. And here it is, and here we are. Do we approach God in thanks, but really thanking ourselves for our accomplishments? Or do we come to God with nothing, with empty hands, and look totally for God's mercy? What is the result of the two approaches in the parable Jesus tells? The Pharisee gets smug to the point of despising others, looking down on them from his righteous seat. For him, there are only two kinds of people, the righteous and the immoral. That's it. 
And he's glad, he's grateful. He's placed himself with the righteous. Good for me, he says to God. To me, as I hear this parable, the tax collector is not peacefully and righteously humble. He's not thinking about it. He is overwhelmed by his need for God. He doesn't have time to divide people into my side and their side. As he stands near the temple, he's not thinking about what he's done or what he deserves. He hopes only and totally for God to have mercy. And just a note here. Teacher and pastor David Lowe's makes this point. Quote, I don't think, think it's an accident that this exchange takes place at the temple. On the grounds of the temple, you were always intimately aware of who you were, of what status you had, of what you could expect from God. There were at the temple insiders and outsiders. And according to these rules, there was no question of where the Pharisee and the tax collector stood. But when Jesus dies, all this changes. As the Gospels report, the curtain of the temple is torn in two, Luke 23, 45, symbolically erasing all divisions of humanity before God. That act is prefigured here as God justifies, not the one favored by temple law, but rather the one standing outside the temple gate and aware only of his utter need. End quote. So this parable is a trap. A trap set by Jesus himself. If we succumb to the temptation to divide people into us and them, we have placed ourselves right there with the Pharisee. It can be thinking of others as righteous or sinners, who's in and who's out, who's MAGA and who's progressive, who's black or brown and who's white, who's a foreigner and who's a real American. Whatever it is, we are drawing a line between people and we are doomed. When we draw a line between ourselves and others, we will find God on the other side of it. Why? Because we have tried to become God ourselves. We have taken upon us the ability, even the right, to judge others. This parable is really about God. God who alone can judge the human heart. God who alone can justify the ungodly and the godly. At the end of this story, at the end of this worship time, at the end of sitting at the feet of Jesus, we can go back home unchanged, like the Pharisee. We will still be righteous in the eyes of the world and in our own eyes. Or we can be changed. We can be accounted righteous by the living God, like the tax collector. When that happens, it will be on the basis of who God is. It will be on the basis of God's divine power and love. Each time we look askance at others, we can stop and draw the circle bigger. We can remember God's mercy and stand before God knowing only our own need. We can return to our homes in joy and gratitude for this awesome life that we share with all God's people on the planet, secure in God's love and wisdom, experiencing peace. Maybe we can remember Jesus' teaching in Luke 18. Maybe we can simply recall that verse by Edwin Markham that we heard in school. He drew a circle that shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle and took him in. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
Please join me in the prayers of evening, ending with the Lord's Prayer, saying the word sins and sin. Let us pray. Grant, O God, that your holy and life-giving spirit may move every human heart, that the barriers dividing us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatred cease, and that with our divisions healed we might live in justice and peace through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, it is your will to hold both heaven and earth in a single peace. Let the design of your great love shine on the waste of our wraths and sorrows and give peace to your church, peace among nations, peace in our homes and peace in our hearts through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Gracious and holy God, give us diligence to seek you, wisdom to perceive you, and patience to wait for you. Grant us, O God, a mind to meditate on you, eyes to behold you, ears to listen for your word, a heart to love you, and a life to proclaim you through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as our Lord Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against you. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining me for Vespers today. I invite you now to receive the benediction. On our heads and in our homes, the blessing of God. In our coming and going, the peace of God. In our life and believing, the love of God. At our end and new beginning, the arms of God to welcome us and bring us home. Amen.